Welcome to In Context, coming to you from Vine Sanctuary, an LGBTQ-led farmed animal refuge in Vermont. We bring you conversations with authors and organizers exploring the connections between animal advocacy, race, gender, and social justice to help put today's big questions in context. Welcome to In Context. I'm Patrice Jones, and I'm here with philosopher Lori Gruen. In Context comes to you from the grounds of Vine Sanctuary in Vermont, and Lori has frequently visited the sanctuary. Like many people, when she first visited the sanctuary, Lori was a little bit afraid of the cows. Most people don't realize how big cows are. They can be really scary, especially if they're trying to play with you, like a cow called Milkshake was trying to do with Lori. Um, but after several visits, Lori was able to become friendly with cows, mostly because a cow called Rosie came up to her and reached out to her in a kind of friendship. Rosie came to the sanctuary uh, from a dairy where she had lived for many years, having many calves taken from her. And when she first came to the sanctuary, we thought that she was shy because she was very, very quiet, especially in comparison to her companion, Autumn, who was very bold. But then about six months later, she, Rose burst out of her shell, walking up to a visitor uh, to ask for a greeting. And then her personality emerged and she turned out to be a practical joker. So it wasn't that she was shy, it was that she was depressed uh, from all of her experiences at the dairy. And then only after she had been in the safety of sanctuary for a while was her real personality able to come out. Rose is now one of the elder members of the sanctuary where she helps everybody to feel better. It's a real leadership role with an emotional component, particularly when new cows come to the sanctuary and they just don't know what to do. Rose is the one who goes up to them, who lets them know you're safe here and who sort of provides a guide to the sanctuary for them. So Rose is who's gonna be on my mind as I'm talking with our guest today, Lori Gruen, who is a full professor of philosophy at Wesleyan University, also a professor of feminist gender and sexuality studies at Wesleyan University, and the coordinator of the animal studies program at Wesleyan University, uh, which she co-founded. Lori, welcome. It's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, you have uh, two two of your many, many books are coming out, have just come out in a second edition. And I want to talk to you about that today. But before I do that, I think people could hear professor of this, professor of that, and think that you're just somebody who's like in an ivory tower thinking about things in the abstract. But I know that I've seen a photo of you maybe in your early 20s being carried out physically by police from a university building um, where, I don't know, I guess you were protesting something. Can you tell me about that and tell us about like, when did you become vegan? Were you always an academic or were you an activist? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. The picture that you're referring to is a picture um, of a protest that I organized at the medical center at the University of Arizona where they were doing um, experiments on greyhound dogs. And um, there were five of us who were protesting and we were arrested um, because we wouldn't leave when they asked us to leave. It was a pretty typical kind of direct action protest that was happening around the time. It was the early 1980s. And I um, became vegan actually um, earlier than that, um, late 70s. And um, it was a really difficult time to be vegan because there weren't any vegan products to really purchase. Um, I had to make my own soy milk, for example. Um, but I became very active while I was in graduate school. And I ended up leaving graduate school to do activist work for about six years in Washington, DC. 
um, with a number of different organizations, um, including um, organizations that were working for women and their companion animals who were homeless. Um, but I was also doing a lot of activism with um, animal organizations at that time before I went back to graduate school and decided to bring my activist um, sensibilities to my scholarship. Do you remember what it was initially that, that uh, led you to go vegan and drew you into animal advocacy? Yeah, actually, the, interestingly, it was philosophy classes. It was my philosophy class in undergraduate. And so I, what, I had no idea. I was always somebody who was drawn to animals, drawn to the kinds of people who were dispossessed or othered, as, just kept at the margins. Um, and so I was always interested in thinking about why is it that some people have privilege and entitlement and so many others, including other animals are on the outside. Um, but it was, I had really no idea how animals were treated. And it was actually in a philosophy class that I learned. And that's what got me excited about philosophy. And as I said, I, I pursued philosophy for a while, then I went and did activism for a while, and then I went back to philosophy. And now I teach students and get them excited about animal activism and animal studies and animal ethics more generally. Wow. And then speaking of animal ethics, one of your many books, if we were to try to talk about all your books, then we would just use up all of our time listing their titles and summarizing them. But one of your many books, Ethics and Animals, uh, has just been re-released -re in a second edition, and it's called Ethics and Animals, uh, and it's published by Cambridge University Press, yes? Yes, that's right, that's right. What, what makes that, uh, why would people want to read that particular book on animal ethics? What makes it different? I think that um, one of the things that I do in Ethics and Animals is provide um, very grounded ways of thinking about our relationships with other animals. I do provide an overview of the variety of different ways that people have thought about our relationships with animals. And I provide what I hope is an opinionated but also balanced look at the various ways that people have tried to theorize about how to act and how to be in our relationships with animals. But in that book, what I really try to do is bring readers into particular problems and help them th think through how to solve those problems. I notice that as you're talking about this, you keep saying our relationships with animals, our relationships with animals. And it seems like that's a central component of your way of thinking about ethics. It's through relationships. Exactly. So ultimately, most people get involved in thinking about animals by thinking about minimizing suffering. And I also think about minimizing suffering. And animals are um, suffering horrendously and so much violence is perpetuated on animals. So I'm not suggesting that the focus on suffering should not be a focus, but there's a difference between questions in my mind between how we quote unquote treat animals versus how we see ourselves in relationships with animals. When we see ourselves in relationships with animals, the kinds of obligations and perspective taking that we can engage in is much more grounded than it is when we think in abstract terms about how we should treat these others. So one of the things that I said earlier, and I think is so important, is thinking about how it is that some people remain at the center and some people who, are, who tend to be humans remain at the center and all the rest of us end up on some margin. And if we think instead about our complicated relationships with one another, that includes both insiderness, outsiderness, privileges, disadvantages, all of those things, we can come to get a richer picture of what it is that we're doing and how we can act ethically. That makes total sense. And I know that uh, hearing you talk about this, uh, talking about uh, uh, our relationships with animals um, and the ways that people are in complicated relationships with animals, even if they're not consciously aware of that, has actually influenced my animal advocacy in terms of giving me a language to talk a different way, to talk about uh, veganism, to talk about animal rights uh, with people who might not be open to that. And that uh, is to uh, just point out 
uh, that uh, you're already in relationship with animals, especially to people who say, well, I'm too busy uh, working on this problem or that problem. I can't really think about animals at all. Uh, but to be able to then say, but you're already in relationship with other animals. If there's, if there's, if there's meat on your plate, that's a relationship uh, with that animal. Um, it's a relationship of dominance and control, um, but it's a relationship. Violent. It's violent. a violent relationship. And, and most people don't want to be in violent relationships. And the people with whom I'm speaking, you know, tend to be people who are against violence and who want to be in good relationships and are against um, relationships that are marked by power and control. And so I found it really useful, Lori, to use your way of framing the question uh, with, within an acknowledgement of our relationships with other animals, even if it's just to remind people of those relationships and to encourage them to think about whether those are the kinds of relationships they want to be in. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. And I think that these relationships aren't necessarily immediate relationships. They can be distant relationships. I often talk about, as you know, palm oil and the problem with orangutans and other animals that are being decimated and wiped off the planet because of our ubiquitous use of palm oil. And even though I'm not in direct relation to the orangutans that are losing their homes, um, when I purchase products, and so many vegan products have palm oil in them, when I purchase products, I'm in a bad relationship with the animals whose habitat we just destroyed. The other thing I think is really important in thinking about these things relationally is that when we think about, as you were saying, when we think about being in bad relationships, we're already motivated to make them better. There's a motivation that's built in. I can't be too busy to think about my engaging in violence. I have to think about it. And I'm motivated to try to make my relationships near and far better this is so thought-provoking uh for me and i think also relates perfectly to the other book i wanted to talk about today which is the second issue of the book called ecofeminism uh i think it's called what's the subtitle it's feminist intersections with other animals and the earth. Right. A and long, <laughs> it is. It is. And it's a long book, uh, but it's not a book that you wrote. It's a book that you co-edited uh, with Carol J. Adams. Uh, and it includes, I guess, at least a dozen or more chapters wow. by different people. Uh, uh, I'm not, I, I suppose I should disclose that I'm one of those people. You are one of those, a very popular chapter in the book. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the second edition, which just came out from Bloomsbury, um, has a whole new section. So there's a whole seven new essays in that, in the volume and the older essays, one of your, your chapters, um, you wrote for the first edition and it's there still. Um, and there's also a very, a new introduction to uh, the volume. Uh, it is quite hefty these days, but it's really a rich volume. The, there's three sections. There's a section on affect or feeling. There's a section on context. And now there's a section on climate. And the section on climate isn't just about the environment, you know, the climate crisis and the environment, but it's also dealing with the climate of thinking about human relations with animals, feminist relations with animals, particularly black feminist relations with animals. So it's, uh, in, and the environment more broadly. And so it's an interesting um, section that deals with both the larger climate issue and the climate of thinking about feminism and other um, areas in the context of animal liberation and environmentalism. One of the things I really love about the book uh, is the introduction that you wrote with Carol Adams, which also includes a timeline. Uh, and the timeline actually runs along the edges of the pages. And what kinds of things are included in the timeline? So the timeline runs throughout the whole book. And so now that the book is even longer, we could include more things in the timeline. So what we include, for example, is one of the first protests against the use of animals in laboratories in the 1800s, one of the very first feminist protests against animal use in the US and the March on Washington. So there's all these different and um, books that have been published. Um, protests and histories that um, have happened. So it's a really rich um, I, idea. And you could just sort of flip through the edge of the book and you could see 
all these different things that have happened from the invention of tofu <laughs> to the publication of oxen at the intersection. So there's all sorts of uh, the founding of Vine Sanctuary, the sort of um, the very first conference um, for animal rights, the very first ecofeminism conference. So there's a lot of exciting information in that timeline. I love it because then you can you when you're when you're reading the book, when you're reading the different ideas of the different contributors to the book, you're reading them in the context of this whole timeline of things that have happened um, and of, of, of feminists thinking about animals and, and trying to do whatever we can uh, to uh, improve our relationships with animals. And I know that context is a super important factor or, or, or idea within ecofeminism. It's an absolutely central idea. And one of the things that I think is so important, not just about contextualizing oneself and one's activities historically, looking at the foremothers or the forebearers of those ideas, um, but also importantly, the kinds of issues that arise in particular spaces make it so that we can't actually abstract away. And when we're paying attention to particular not just problems or issues, but particular animals and particular people who are involved in these kinds of, um, let's say dilemmas or issues, problems that occur. Um, we can come to the, the problems with a framework, and I think of it as an ethical framework, but it's also a political framework um, that allows us to take in what's special, what's specific, about this particular situation. And I think that one way that ecofeminism is fundamentally different from other ways of approaching ethical problems or our relationships with animals more broadly is that we really are concerned about the context. And by that, I also wanted to say that what that means is you have to ask questions about the very specific other that you're talking about. You can't make a generalization about what do cows want? Well, which cows, who? Who are you talking about? Are you talking about Rose? Are you talking about Scotty? Are you talking about uh, Mooton? So there's a whole important sense in which when you contextualize the problems, to use a phrase that um, the late ecofeminist Marty Kiel said, you're not truncating the narrative. You're not cutting off all of the important factors that need to be attended to in any given situation. That's what it means to pay attention to context in ecofeminist terms. And, and, and I just have to say, when I asked you that question, I totally had forgotten that the name of the show is in context. You did. <laughs> yes, I love that the name of the show is in context. So, 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 so uh, we're talking about your book, uh, uh, Ethics and Animals, and we're talking about your book, uh, your edited book, Ecofeminism. Uh, both of which have come out in a second edition uh, this year, 2022. Uh, and, and so I take it then that uh, eco, you would think ecofeminist ethics then would be ethics that attend to relationships and that are in context. Right. And I think also it's important to keep in mind that not all um, ecofeminists have the same perspective. Ecofeminists are in different contexts, of course. So they're going to have different ways of thinking. And so there's not an overarching abstract ecofeminist principle that is going to tell you how to act and how to think and how to be. That's not what ecofeminism is about. Ecofeminism is not saying that we that women are essentially closer to nature. This is not what ecofeminism is saying. Um, ecofeminism is not saying that there's one way to act or one way to be. This is not what ecofeminism is saying. Ecofeminism is to a large extent, much very concerned about avoiding abstraction, paying attention to context. That's another way of putting that. And fundamentally it's about care. It's about focusing on both the ethical and the political and collective sense of care. And so Vine Sanctuary, of course, is an ecofeminist sanctuary, which means it's a, it's a sanctuary um, in part, that is really focused on that capacity to care. Well, thank you for the shout out uh, <laughs> to, to Vine Sanctuary. And I, I know that uh, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but I know that there's another book of yours that I think you wrote specifically with the hope that activists would read it, 
um, that also seems to be related to these topics we've been talking about, and that's called Entangled Empathy, mm-hmm. Entangled published by Lantern. Lantern published it um, back in 2015, and Entangled Empathy is a book that tries to articulate in um, various ways some of the ideas that I've been talking about. Now, um, Entangled Empathy isn't really just about empathy and being empathetic. It's a Entangled Empathy is... Um, articulates a a particular set of perspective taking skills, if you will, that involve our bodies, our minds, our feelings, our hearts, all working together to try to sort out and take the perspective of another and figure out how we might bring about their flourishing and a more flourishing world. Um, So Entangled Empathy is, is a book that describes that process and um, and I and describe some problems and pitfalls that one has when one's trying to hone those skills. Um, but it's something that I think has um, not been talked about in quite the same way that I talk about it before. And I did hope that activists would would be interested in the book. Um, I, I wrote the book in part because in giving a number of talks in different contexts, I was so uh, surprised and excited that so many people were interested in hearing more about what I was talking about when I was talking about empathy. So I decided to write it up in a book um, called Entangled Empathy. It's a short book. Yeah, it is. So so how does it, how does it feel for you? We, we, at the beginning of the show, we talked about how you started out as a, as a, a student of philosophy who was so moved uh, by what you began to think about with re- with regard to uh, our relationships with other animals, that you went vegan, got involved in, in animal activism, actually got so involved in animal activism that you delayed your schooling for a number of years. Um, but now you're this fancy pants professor of, of philosophy um, who is in a position to uh, teach, teach others uh, and spark that kind of thinking for others. Do you have some, I don't know, reflect, that's a, that's a, that's quite a journey. Do you have any reflections for us about that? Well, I, I know that when I first was um, exposed to the idea of how we were treating animals and what relationships we were in with with animals, I was really sad. I was shocked. I was angry. Um, I was politicized and I wanted to do something. And that's what ultimately led me to do activist work. And I I realized that um, maybe I would do, um, I could do a certain kind of activism by taking up the ideas with other people and my students. And so one of the things that's been really rewarding is having the students who also, like I did, was we're like, wait, what? Um, And they have their lives changed and they want to do things to help animals. And um, building the animal studies program at Wesleyan has been really terrific because that we've, we've just had so many students come through who are so interested in making the world a better place for, for humans and other animals. And, and that's pretty um, motivating and enlivening for me. It gives me a lot of energy. Um, I know a lot of the a lot of the students go on to do various kinds of work. Some go on to be veterinarians, some go on to work in sanctuaries, some go on to work in animal organizations, some go on to be animal lawyers, some go on to do sort of arts and media. So it's just an exciting kind of way of informing and inspiring and engaging these students to um, go out and try to make things better for animals. Well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm so impressed always by your body of work uh, for, for, again, this is Lori Gruen, uh, po- uh, philosophy professor at Wesleyan University. We've been talking about two of her books, uh, Ethics and Animals, which just came out in a second edition, and Ecofeminism, uh, co-edited with Carol J. Adams. We also mentioned Entangled Empathy, and there are other books, so many other books, Uh, So I really encourage people to check out those books. In the meantime, Lori, I want to thank you not only for for making time to talk with us today, but also for all of your decades of of labor and thought and deeply felt effort um, on behalf of of our non-human kin. Um, uh, I know that it may not always feel like it's adding up, but I think that I think that your work for sure 
uh, has added up to, to a substantial uh, benefit uh, for other animals and, and the planet. So I want to thank you for that as well, for what it's worth. Thank you so much. It's, it's worth a lot to me. I really do appreciate that. Um, it's it's sometimes a bit lonely writing books. Um, it's not less lonely teaching. It's obviously less lonely working with with those who work with animals and the animals themselves. But I really do appreciate your appreciation, and I'm really glad I got to be here. Yay! Um, so uh, again, check out Lori Gruen's books. Uh, if you want to learn more about In Context, uh, you can go to the Vine Sanctuary website, vinesanctuary.org, and look at the In Context page where you can see show notes from today in case you missed any of the book titles that we've mentioned, as well as recordings of past shows and upcoming episodes. This has been Patrice Jones at Vine Sanctuary for In Context. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>